A short history of the Night Lord's Benevolence Company and its now deceased commander Aelin Dragos. Day 1 of the Assault on Scala at Kylum. Praetor Aelin Dragos led the more eager elements of his benevolence battle group down amongst the remains of Obfermo's industrial sector with a thought to bring the galactic truth of peace through fear slash death to any remaining citizens. Just as Aelin had found what was left of a Bane Blade crew to enlighten, Reed skin him alive, a force of Iron Hands cruelly intervened, not being fans of true justice they proceeded to give the Night Lords a bloody nose. Aelin Dragos was able to cut down the Iron Warrior's leader but then disappeared in a hail of plasma, never to be seen again. Fortunately the brave Terra Squad lenience was able to spirit the captive away. Some would have accused them of fleeing and hiding in a hole for the majority of the battle, those individuals will be visited and made literate to the truth. Somehow a force of Night Lords missed the initial drop to the planet, and were on hand to stop a Mechanicum plot to damage the Blade of Chthonyur. Pick captures taken just before the combat seem to suggest that the Night Lords were in fact scavenging bits of Imperial Fists literal bits, but their commander would like to assure all friendly forces that they really wanted to be there for the initial assault, no matter how brutal it would have been it's just that they heard a commotion near the plasma coils and felt duty bound to investigate, what, what we were we doing on the Chthonia you might ask bzzzzphff wap, you seem to be breaking up. Day 2 of the assault on Scala at Kylum. Upset at having to give up their captive Bane Blade captain to the Emperor's children, the boys of Squad Quietus followed the trail of spilled lotion and pixie dust to the outskirts of the capital. There they found the captain dressed in what seemed to be a gimp outfit trying to repair a damaged Bane Blade with colorful streamers, party balloons and mysterious white powder. After eviscerating a couple of appendages the Night Lords took the Baneblade for a spin straight into a solar auxilia tank line got it blown up and then had to call in aerial support to clean up all the mess. After two days of brutal carnage the inky blackness of Scala and Kylum's night sky was in ascendance when flitting shadows formed shapes of claws and wings amongst the industrial wastes. The Night Lords had found the Raven Guard and blood was soon to be shed. Then there was the time Savitar guest starred as the commander only to be left to die on an exploding arc. Arc Phileas, the race to Spiritus Sanctus. In the outer regions of the Phileas system the traitor forces have discovered a relic of the founding of the Theocracy. It is an arc, Cyclinda that is spun to generate gravity. It is a generation colony ship that has lain dormant for centuries the key found in the ruins of Obferma by the traitors granted them access. Recent intel points to a hidden system the Theocracy has considered, with only the name of Spiritus Sanctus and a rumor of forbidden weaponry. Now both sides race to uncover the keys to the Ark's bridge, and then find the warp route to Spiritus and the secrets it holds. As emergency lights flickered off and on, whilst clarion notes shrieked from emergency boxes and as the crew were buffeted about by impact hits Yego Savitarian remained impassive as he stared at the hologram of a spinning giant. Benjamin Yago's removing his cataphractic pattern helmet, found himself wondering how Savitar's face seemed to give less away than the ceramide masks of his fellow brothers. Regardless he fancied he knew what thoughts were tumbling around behind that mask of a face, even amidst the carnage of the void battle between Horus's lackeys and the false emperor's minions. It was apparent to any neophyte, there was no access into this giant Arkansas all airlocks, docking bays and points of ingress were occupied by other legions and no one would be granting the Night Lord's entry be they friend or foe. At that point Savitar moved for the first time in an hour and stared straight into Yargos' eyes Prepare, Prepare the launch, launch bays, let those who call themselves my guard meet me at bay 14, we have our entry point. Yargo did not understand, what had Savitar seen that had escaped his own vision where would they be landing as he started his question Yago I see not, Yago grinned, the look on him was more terrifying than even his mortis mask of a helmet do you not see Benny? That spot right there, it looks thin to me, I say we go right through it and see what's up, ha, on the inside. Oh and Benny make sure the Red Hands pod is first, just in case this giant needs a firm knock before opening its doors. 
Kalin meets Raven Guard Flame Vets for the first but definitely not last time. Aelin Dragos looked at the grainy images flickering across the data slate, it seemed the mighty sons of Horus weren't so implacable after all. Disappointingly it looked like he'd have to commit his troops and what was more unpleasant he knew the sons would expect him to make an appearance. As Aelin made his way to the teleportation transponder he noticed images of the raptors of subjugation squad shredding a mob of robots to pieces with a wry grin he realized that yet again the raptors had gone rogue and there had been no controlling them this battle. Aelin took a knee amongst the ruins his terminator squad had materialized in thankful that they were still in one piece, his HUD display showed they had control of the skies and the terror squads moving amongst raptor bodies harvesting. As he stood up focusing on the monstrous robots bursting through the ruins towards him he felt the resounding impact that could only be a drop pod, surely he was the last to arrive thought Aelin just as a torrent of hellfire flames engulfed him and all his surroundings drowning the world in Promethean hues of death. Our hero starts a feud. As always, death was on Aelin's side. The Salamander's Paragon Blade was embedded in Aelin Dragos's left pauldron as the Salamander Commander reversed his grip and proceeded to drag the blade towards Aelin's hearts, Alan's chain fist plunged through the exquisite embossed artificer armor parting ceramite and adamantium creating a hue of sparks, adding an orange tinge to the Salamander heart Alan's fist dragged out. As Aelin reached back to complete the set he sensed the sudden absence of combat sounds surrounding him, he didn't need the warning sign of the quaking ground to know the contempt he had wounded was finished. Having slaughtered its way through the druce and was coming for revenge. A wry smile creased Alan's face as he activated his personal teleporter his job done he returned to the night, trophy in hand. A gathering of heroes. The aftermath consternation destroyed. Clink, clink, clink. There was a rhythm to it. A definite beat. Clink, clink, clink. But there was an undeniable hollowness to it. And something old worldy too. Clink, clink, clink. Like a hollow mineral knocking against another hollow mineral. Clink, clink, clink. The substance was calcium based, and the shapes had a dome to them, which gave the hollow sound when they met. Clink, clink. Thing. But the rhythm was continuous and unabating, matching his every footfall. Clink, clink, clink. Tied from his waist, the two objects would strike together in time with his stride. Until he stopped, in which case the object's momentum continued as they would then clatter into each other, adding yet further scratches to their once perfect smoothness. Not that the bearer had ever seen them perfectly smooth. Eviscerating the skin off was not done clumsily, but it certainly wasn't done with great precision, and the bare bone stones thus had plenty of imperfections across their surfaces before he had tied the trophies to the waist of his armor. Pausing momentarily for the door in front of him to open, he strode into the room. It was dark. Though he preferred it that way. Its familiarity reflected the dark planet he grew up on, those many centuries ago. His host kept to the dark shadows. Sharing his kinship, he too favored darkness. Two others wore long cameo line camouflage cloaks, under which armor decorated with pale sea green scales showed. These both turned to face the newcomer, you acted irrationally. There was still time to assess the damage the loyalists have done, and understand what intel they gained. Knowing what your enemy knows, can be used against them. Surely even a simple Nostromian ganger could cogitate that. He inclined his pasty white features towards the Alpha Legion officer that addressed him, casualties he began matter-of-factly, I had already taken 70% losses to my Terminators. My position would have soon become untenable. That was a lie, and the actual truth, was that he didn't care about the losses. It meant that there would be fewer elites to potentially stab him in the back and take command themselves. That was why the two mementos which dangled from his hip were so, so useful. The figure in the shadows spoke, his resonating tones appearing like a disembodied voice in the gloom, Consternation station is destroyed, their fleet fled. What more of it? Those of the Alpha Legion didn't turn to face the voice which spoke, but kept their attention focused on him. Though withdrawn to the Peripherium Platoon's system, 
their fleet is still a coherent force. And as what information they were able to ascertain is unknown, we shall have to change our cipher codes, our e-supply convey routes, everything. And that, will all take time. He was quick to respond and no doubt you have agents in the system already. The brief silence answered that statement. So don't be too disgenuine over the matter. They, can sow their seeds of misinformation, and tell us just how to murder the bastards. There was a silence which hung in the air over that. The cloaked legionaries could have said much in return, but they knew it would have been to little use or gain. For, For the Emperor, Emperor was their sole reply, which they said in unison. His pasty pale features slowly arched round as he watched the two Alpha Legion figures leave through a different door to which he arrived in. Once gone his focus snapped to his Night Lord host, the eyesight developed in the never-ending darkness of Nostromo penetrating all shadows. Was this the purpose of my summons? A slap on the wrist? Ignoring the direct question, those on you. Who were they? Glancing down to the dangling skulls tied to his waist, he thought back to the duel with the Salamander Captain, and then how he later used his chain fist to open up the sarcophagus of a fallen Salamander Dreadnought. He had no idea who they were, only what they were. So he kept his reply short, 18th. He cared little for conversation and small talk, so wanted to keep his presence here purposeful to Pelagus Platones, he said, more as a statement than a question. The other stepped away from the wall he was leaning against, the dangling chains and decorative skeletal remains clinking against his armor as he moved keep an ear to the air for intel from the 20th. Their clandestine warfare is not dissimilar to ours, but with differences. Differences that will help us bring bloody slaughter to these runts and let us cut their hearts out. Sensing the value of the conversation gone, he stepped backwards towards the door he entered, careful not to turn his back on his gene brother. He bade a minimalist farewell, muttering see you on Invicta, before exiting the room. Enemy's Plot. The Beginning of an End. The Loyalist Plot. Electric pulses sent down the wiring activated the small motor, dictating the velocity, rotation, and level of torque. The motor in turn, connected to a series of cogs, gears operated drive trains, more like pistons in appearance, the end of which were a further set of cogs and gears. The final mechanism to move in this orchestrated ballet of mechanical engineering, were his fingers. Looking down at the brass bronze digits as he flexed them back and forth, he was left feeling resentment at such a crude-looking device. Martian engineering cares more for base function than form and beauty. He will have to rectify this in his forge later. Though he held greater lamentation for the severing of his biological arm in the first place, which was regrettably lost to him from a duel with a chain-fisted Night Lord creator during the Orbis campaign. Turning his gaze up from his mechanized hand, though nighttime the sky was far from the traditional midnight blue of a nitrogen-rich atmosphere. Flu stacks had turned the yonder yellow hue, with the unrelenting discharge of waste sulfurous gases from the chemical industry which defined the planet. Those chimneys dotted the horizon, their chemtrails which streaked high into the sky, were obvious even for those with unaugmented eyesight. In a sudden moment, his attention was snapped back to the purpose as to why he was here. His observation and conscience was locked onto the flying vehicle which approached. Its supersonic approach gave the illusion that it appeared out of nowhere. The craft's retro thrusters noisily slowed the ship and loudly announced its arrival, as it set down only tens of meters away. The decibels were high enough that he didn't just hear it, but felt it through his spinal cord and frontal lobe. Once descent was completed and the vessel safely landed, a solitary figure alighted and approached them. They in turn walked forward to intercept him. Towering head and shoulders above them, the gold warrior was busy and wanted to keep the exchange as efficient as possible, simply stating report. A magus of the Martian Brotherhood replied first, speaking in a flat monotone electronic voice, the artificial synthesizer having replaced the organic vocal cords centuries ago the ring of fortifications around the refineries have been strengthened and reinforced with imperial armor units. The one with the bionic arm turned his face rapidly around to his cybernetic colleague, with urgent concern in his voice the refineries? 
We aren't protecting the civilians? The Magus, his body language clearly irritated by the interruption and questioning of his strategy responded loss of the Hive City is tolerable. Loss of the supply of Prometheum, Plasma Coolant, and Adamantium ingots to this sector are not. Turning back to the armor-plated figure in gold the Magus concluded and there are stockpiles of chlorine and mustard gas artillery shells, synthesized from refinery byproducts, plus nerve agents sarin and anthrax. These have been distributed to those army units. Looking aghast, the lime green plated figure with the false arm was barely able to comprehend what he heard we intend to unleash biological and chemical weapons. Exasperated he add why not just exterminate us the planet now? Enough. The Custodes had flown too long a to have any patience to hear bickering between his generals. He didn't have time for it. Magus, the surface forts will need to hold if the plan is to work. We will engage the enemy in the void and. Turning to the green armored salamander officer, briefly attempted some diplomatic exchange, and catch them between the hammer and the anvil. Concluding the conversation he asked the Magus now, show me what other non-conventional munitions you have prepared for these traitorous curds. Save for the deck crew, the 18th Legion commander was left alone on the landing pad, astounded and astonished at the exchange he had just heard. Such warfare does not follow the Edict of Vulcan. He would have his revenge for his fallen brethren at Plutones, and for his left arm. But not like this. Never like this. The end. Blood was booling in his mouth and uncontrollably dribbling down the sides of his cheeks. He was spitting blood out messily as he cursed them with what energy he had left. The Nostromian was gurgled and incoherent, but he knew he was about to die and would want to spend every last ounce of energy in defiance. The focus of those efforts was channeled onto the figure which slowly approached him. If he was able, he would have lifted his pistol and taken aim. But smashed limbs, near paralysis and almost total desanguination meant was not able. His vision was beginning to lose focus, and grey out around the edges. The figure seemed to raise something. He brought the hammer head down. It didn't just cave in the cranial skull, but completely splattered it, spreading a jelly-like consistency of matter at least a meter in a circle around the point of impact. He looked down at the hammer's head. He hadn't engaged the power field, not wanting to waste the energy cells on finishing off these curves. His top lip curled in the corner as he studied the same jelly-like matter over the dragon-shaped bronze head. Flicking the activation stud he sent a pulse of lightning blue energy down the haft, and cooked off the organic matter with a sizzle, leaving the bronze clean of stain am detained. His snarl turned into a half smile. The beginning. The adamantium alloy was imperfectly cast, and there was even evidence of rust patches, but the physical properties still suited its intended use. That use had been to pierce a hydrocarbon sulfur based rubber seal and further penetrate into its target, specifically a biological tube which, now ruptured, was energetically ejaculating a bright red iron aqueous solution, back up the adamantium in rhythmic spurts and down a midnight blue colored ceramite plate. The solution darkened in color, as platelets coagulated in a biological self defense to heal the puncture. To no avail and the liquid continued to ooze down from the neck wound, repainting the figure's armored from dark blue to reddy brown. This very public murder had two purposes, to tie up a loose end, and to make a statement. The former co-conspirator had been the one in charge of coordinating the deep strike, and it was no accident that the now also dead creator was teleported in a position exposed to enemy fire. The one holding the adamantium blade smiled at the memory of lighting the Prometheum fuel in his jetpack and taking to the sky, leaving his former leader to the withering fire that would claim his life. Freshly returned to the strike cruiser, it was vital to cement his ascension in rank quickly, and this public murder gave the twofold purpose. Retching the blade free from the neck, the other Night Lord sergeants watched on as the murdered body slumped to the ground, and then looked up to face their new leader. He threw the blade down by the body, and pointed to a, seemingly at random, sergeant, give, give me his skull. skull. The appointed sergeant started to create this new trophy and simply said yes, yes creator. creator. Aelin Dragos is dead. Long live.
Boy, I'm the mute.